Thank you so much. And it is, uh, it's great to be back with you this morning. It's been uh, a couple of weeks since I've been up here. Last week, and I had an opportunity to spend some time for Thanksgiving with my family in Chicago and celebrate my mom and dad's 50th wedding anniversary. And then all week long, Darren Geyer and I have been in the country of Haiti and uh, getting our eyes open to that part of the world and um, just seeking God's wisdom. We spent the week with seven pastors, the guys up on the top left there, from around the country, just uh, looking at the, the ministry of Worldwide Vision, which is a ministry located here in the Twin Cities. Breland Lean from our congregation interned with them last summer. It's, it's just a wonderful Christian humanitarian organization that's doing some great things in Haiti. And we went because for the past couple of years, we've really sensed that God is doing something special in our congregation as it relates to this country. It began when Sarah Lean uh, started going down to Haiti after the earthquake to see the orphanage where her nephews had come from and to take a look at how she might be a blessing to the people there. As a teacher in St. Paul, she found out there's a school associated with the orphanage and began to do some teacher training and coming alongside of them. And so uh, as a mission board, we, we prayed, Lord, are there some ways that we can be involved uh, to even greater capacity as a church. So that was part of why we went down there and had an opportunity to see um, a new arrival orphanage. The boys in the top right, you heard about, many of you here a few weeks ago, when the Pierces and the Haraldsons shared their faith story. Um, they, God is calling uh, these two families to adopt Stanley and Devinsley. Devinsley's there on the left with me and Stanley's with Darren on the right. And we had an opportunity to bring them some Christmas gifts from their families to um, share uh, some books that the families had created for them about the homes they're going to be coming into and the church homes they're going to be coming into and just some really, really special things. I had a chance right before the first service, I didn't get to put video online because uh, uh, it was just too big and the internet connection in Haiti was too slow, but called the Pierces and Haraldsons into my office to play about the last 30 seconds of the video of the boys opening their gifts where they turned to their parents and said, hi, mom, hi, dad, and it was pretty special. So they got to see that right before um, first service and just, just a, a special, special time. And we visited a number of uh, churches and pastors, um, probably met with about seven or eight pastors this week, went to um, five or six schools and a couple of orphanages and just really saw God do some great things. And one of the things that um, I certainly saw is that Haiti is a land of contrast. Um, before the devastating earthquake in January of 2010, so we're coming up on three years next month since the earthquake hit, before that earthquake, Haiti was one of the poorest uh, countries in the world. And the earthquake uh, just rocked that country to the core. You all know that 316,000 Haitians lost their life in that earthquake. Um, and uh, just trying to pick up the pieces of that are so difficult. This is a country that was once considered to be the jewel of the Caribbean. And it, it is just, there, there are such contrasts. You see things like on the right, this was in Port-au-Prince this week as we were driving by, you, you see this street um, on the top right, just filth, um, and, and uh, that's kind of on your way. Uh, about three blocks past that is a tent city. There are over 400,000 Haitians still living in tent cities today, three years after the earthquake. Um, there, there was a spot as we were driving along that uh, Randy Mortensen, who's the head of Worldwide Village, asked our driver if he would take us down a little bit further past the tent cities into what is considered to be the slums worse than the tent cities. And, and he just said, we can't do that today. It's too dangerous. Every night in these tent cities, there are little girls that are being raped. Um, the health crises are terrible. Children swim in urine and feces. And it is just a tough, tough life to this day. And the bottom right is a picture of a building downtown Port-au-Prince uh, on a street that was once considered the most beautiful street in the city. And uh, three years later, this building still stands like this, looking like the, the floors could fall at any moment. And yet, um, and, and so the question people have asked me is, so what are some of the words that come to mind when you think of Haiti? And there's two words that come to mind. Number one is uh, overwhelming. This is just an overwhelming humanitarian crisis. There's over 7,000 mission organizations working in Haiti. There are more missionaries in Haiti than any other country in the world. And, you know, it's one of those things that aid isn't always the answer. Um, and, and aid is important, but, it, but, but aid to the detriment of Haitians is... is uh, is not a good thing. Um, and so there's this overwhelming um, sense that you get there as you go through there because even 7,000 
mission organizations are just scratching the surface on the need in the country right now. And that's hard to believe when you think about those types of numbers. And then on the left side, you see just this beauty. There's this contrast of beauty and, and Haiti, too. And r one of the things Randy said is, I always want to take people to see the beautiful side of Haiti, too, because people don't ever recognize that that side is there. And there's uh, just, just some incredible beauty in this country, too. Second word that comes to mind, though, is hope. And there's a lot of hope right now in Haiti. There is, uh, there is a lot of good that's being done. And so while we're scratching the surface, it is being scratched. And there are uh, great things happening. It, uh, and, and Christians and non-Christians uh, working alike to try to accomplish some, some beautiful things there. The orphanage where Stanley and Devinsley are going to be um, adopted from. And there's some really neat things that are happening there. One of the things that I love is so many churches in Haiti have started orphanages and schools. And so the next generation of Haitian children um, are experiencing an education that um, I think is going to help change things. But it's a country that still needs our prayer. You can pray for us, for the mission board, as we continue to just pray through and seek you know, what God's direction might be uh, in Haiti. We had an opportunity, I think, to really be a blessing to Worldwide Village this week, too, and, and uh, challenge them and some of their thinking. And, and God's just doing some great things. So I appreciate your prayers this week. One of the things that I saw when I was in Haiti, too, was just love in action. I mean, there was just a lot of people who were pouring love into other people's lives. And, and I loved that. And I loved seeing the church do that. And as we go into the second week in our Advent series, John started last week um, this series in which we're talking about some of the gifts that Christ gives us, this play on words present at Christmas. We're going to talk about that gift of love today. And every week um, you're going to see this picture up here on this wall change a little bit, this, these gifts that God has for us. And so we've got a heart today to rec represent the, the love that Jesus has for us. And next week you're going to see something different on, on that uh, picture. But we're going to talk about love today. And um, to the church at Corinth, you know, we're, we're, we're following along in our challenge readings this year as we go through Christmas. And so we're at the spot where Paul and Silas have visited a church at Corinth. They've actually planted a church at Corinth. And you remember a couple weeks ago, as I shared, we were talking about the church at Philippi. And the church at Philippi, Paul, this church planting missionary, goes there, he plants this church, and he writes them a letter, the book of Philippians, in which he has nothing negative to say about the church at Philippi. We said that Philippians would be one of the greatest books to read if you wanted to read about what Christian maturity is all about. Well, if that was Philippi, Corinth couldn't have been further on the theological and on the moral spectrum as far as churches went. Corinth was Christians gone wild. Paul and, and Silas had gone to Corinth. They, 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 what they saw when they walked into the city was this incredibly wicked and licentious place. Corinth was known for uh, incredible sexual immorality. There were more prostitutes in this section of, of uh, Turkey during that day than anywhere else. And so it would not be uncommon to walk down the streets of Corinth and you would just see uh, lewd sexual acts happening right there in public. Now that's one thing. It's another thing when you realize that their religion that they studied, that they, they followed there, this form of paganism, pr uh, practiced sexual acts as part of a worship service. So you would go to like the temple of Dionysus there, and, and these sexual acts would take place right in the temple as part of their worship. And so Paul and Silas walk into Corinth, and like good church planters, they say, we've got incredible opportunity here. These people have no concept of who God is. They have no concept. We need to plant in a city like this. We need to plant a church and start a movement. And the Holy Spirit poured down upon that place. And God worked. And people's lives were transformed. And so for a period of time, Paul and Silas discipled these young believers. Paul appoints somebody to be the head of the church at Corinth. And because they were church planting missionaries, they never stayed anywhere too long. They left the church at Corinth. And after they leave Corinth, something happens at, uh, at that location. Uh, for whatever reason, the, the guys who were in charge of the church at Corinth didn't stick to the teachings which Paul and Silas had given them. And they allowed some of the pagan practices of their past to creep in with the worship of Jehovah. And so now you have a church that professes a belief in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, with pagan practices of sexuality as well as all sorts of division in the church. And so Paul's letter to this church, when he gets the news that they're acting like they used to act, is just scathing. I mean, you read First and Second Corinthians, and he has so few good things to say about this church. 
but he has some good things to say about them. And so as you read First and Second Corinthians, you do see some encouragement. You do see some discipleship happening there. You see some good things that Paul says about this church, and there are some, some words of hope that he has for them. It reminds me of something that Darren and I saw when we were in Haiti this week. We, we had a chance to talk with this pastor in the middle in this picture here, the guy in the blue shirt. And this is a good guy. He's doing ministry in a town called... Uh, uh, Davison, and he's, he's, he's doing everything that he can to reach out to his community. But he, it, so we asked these pastors at every church we went to, so what are some of the greatest needs for pastors? And he says, oh, brothers. He said, most pastors here have a third grade education or below. He says, the majority of pastors can't even read the Bible. He says, my friends, you know, we've been a little bit more educated, the guys that are in this city. He says, but so many of the pastors around us, they can't read. Some of the guys, because AD has a, Haiti has an 80% unemployment rate, some of these pastors uh, will say that they've been called by God to start a church because it gives them a job. And they're pretty good at saying things, and so people will come to follow them, and then they'll impregnate three or four or five or six women in the congregation. And so they aren't men of God at all. They're these wolves in sheep's clothing. He said, so we need quality pastors. We need pastors who are trained. We don't have any kind of seminaries to, 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 to train us in any ongoing way. There's a few, but they're too expensive, and we, we just need help. And so these were the kind of things we heard. And when I heard about this church, I, I'm thinking about the church at Corinth. You know, Haiti does a lot of things really well. You didn't see a lot of the societal ills that we have here in the United States in Haiti. But when it comes to sexual immorality in Haiti, it's just all over the place. And it's rampant. And it's rampant in the church. Most of the church leaders that we had talked to when we were there had had uh, children by multiple people. Um, and it just breaks my heart. And so, you know, if Paul was writing to the church at Haiti, it might sound a little bit like this church here. And... Uh, you know, I'd like to say, boy, that's just not true of the United States. But we found over and over and over again in churches in the United States that there's all sorts of problems with sexual sin, too. And so we need to continue to pray for the people of Haiti. So Paul, to a church in Corinth that had no concept of what real love was all about, gave probably the most perfect description of love ever written in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And before we get to what he said, I, I asked uh, my boys, Jeremy and Zach, like three years ago, I preached on 1 Corinthians 13, and they were, they were much smaller. I said, guys, what do you think love is? I said, can you give dad a definition of love? And as young boys, they looked at me and they said, yes, love is a strong feeling of like or likeness. I thought it was great. They sounded like, you know, Webster's children, all right? That was just fantastic. So um, that was uh, my boy's definition. I thought, well, I'm going to see what other kids have said. And maybe you've heard some of these definitions of love from children. One child said that love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> I love that. Another child said, and this is beautiful, when someone loves you, the way that they say your name is different. You know that your name is safe in their mouth. And there were some kids this week that I met that would love to know that. Another child said, love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure that it tastes is okay. <laughs> love it. Love it. My wife's been guilty of that on occasion. It's a beautiful thing. Still, another observed, love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he's handsomer than Brad Pitt. <laughs> And finally, one more child said that love is when my grandmother got arthritis. She couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Well, throughout the years, love has been defined many ways. We've uh, seen some really mushy descriptions of love and greeting cards at Valentine's Day. Um, we've seen it defined uh, in music and in culture and in movies as a feeling. We hear people talk about falling in love all the time. But you know, God's word tells us again and again and again that love is a decision. And it's a decision that we need to make every single day of our lives with the people in our lives. If we're going to be people who are characterized by loving each other, then it's going to take an act of the will and the power of the Holy Spirit to make it happen. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul shows the church at Corinth what true love is, and he does it by sharing 10 qualities of true or lasting love qualities that are not possible apart from Jesus Christ's work within us. And so again, so as we look at Christmas and we look at who Jesus is, these are gifts that he gives us. He gives us the ability to love like him. Before we get to Paul's description, C.S. Lewis said this. He had just lost a wife um, to a terrible disease. And he says, love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. 
If you want to be sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, and motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken, but it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where you can be safe from all the dangers of love is hell. It's an interesting thing because love is the most beautiful thing in the world, and yet those who love us the most have the ability to hurt us the most too. Here's what Paul said about love in 1 Corinthians 13, 4-6. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Quality number one of true love is that love is patient. It's really interesting that that would be the first word that Paul uses to describe love. It's a word in the Greek that is the word macrothymia, which is translated forbearance. Last week, John Kimball preached about some of the gifts that Jesus gives us. And he talked about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. And this word macrothymia is used in 5.22 as well. It's this word patience, which as translated here has everything to do with making the choice to have forbearance or show patience with those in our life who have wronged us. I want you to think about that. Sometimes it's easy to be patient with our children and our spouse. I mean, it could be tough. But when somebody's really wronged us, we don't like that person. When the pain is there and the hurt is there, that's the step that God's calling us to here. A love towards somebody who's wronged us. In his commentary on Galatians, William Barclay said, generally speaking, of the word is not used of, generally speaking, the word is not used of patience in regards to things or events. So like you're driving down the road and you're upset because you're in a traffic jam. But it's in regard to people. This is the grace of the man who could take revenge on himself and does not. Could take revenge himself and does not. The man who is slow to wrath. In 1 Corinthians, as Paul described love, he uses that word macrothymia, and he uses it over and over in other writings too. But it's that first descriptor of true love. Relationships that pass the test of time have to demonstrate patience. It's normal over the span of any relationship, whether that's with your spouse or with your friends or your coworkers, that you're going to be hurt by a person. It could be words that are said or left unsaid, unfulfilled promises, expectations that aren't met, or an array of other things or circumstances. The person who practices patience will extend grace to the offender. Paul understood that God regularly demonstrates his patience with man, and God expects us to do the same. The best marriages are those where a husband and wife have learned forbearance with one another. Patience says, I'm not keeping score. I might have every right to strike back at my spouse, but I'm choosing to demonstrate the kind of grace and love that Christ has shown to me. Last weekend, just before leaving for Haiti, we had a chance to go to Chicago. I told you to celebrate my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. And it was a beautiful night. It was my mom and dad and 70 or so other family members and close friends. And we got to celebrate a man and a woman who are still, after 50 years of marriage, profoundly in love with each other. But as a child, I'm going to tell you, this wouldn't have been possible without them extending patience to each other on multiple occasions. Uh, you know, I think of those times when I was growing up where my dad was incredibly busy. And my mom just had this patience with him. And uh, sometimes he didn't deserve it. I remember times uh, these past few years as my mom has struggled with this illness that she's got, the patience that my dad has just shown over and over and over again with her. And my dad had hip surgery recently, and I remember watching and hearing the stories about how my mom, even though she's struggling, kind of like the man with the arthritis, was just loving on my dad and showing patience through those tough times. That's what Paul's talking about here. We show patience with those in our life. Quality number two is kindness. Remember that these are descriptions of love and not just these descriptions of love aren't just in relationships to husbands and wives, but in all relationships. Paul was writing to a church. And so he's saying, hey, Corinth, you know, Corinthian believers, I want you to show this kind of love to each other. And again, there was all sorts of division in this church. And so he says to them, you've got to be kind. Love is kind. Have you ever met a mean person? Yeah, of course you have. Every one of us have. We've got way too many mean people in our lives. Some of us feel that way, okay? And, you know, there's, there's, there's all sorts of things that people maybe have done in your life that have been downright nasty to hurt you. Sometimes Christians can be incredibly nasty 
In fact, sometimes that's the reputation we have. God's calling Christians to be kind, and the reputation that we have is that we're mean. In their book on Christian, which I've talked about many times since becoming your pastor, Dave Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons, in this study of how 16 to 29-year-olds who are outside of the faith feel about Christians, said that one of the top descriptors that non-Christians give about Christians is that Christians are mean. Well, we got to be leading the way in being kind. We have to be the people in our community that, that, that people uh, know, love them, and care for them. Somehow the church over the years has become known more for what we're against than what we're for. Kindness and compassion always go hand in hand. It's one of the reasons why in Reach 15 we say that as a church we want to do everything that we can in these years ahead to become passionate about those people that Christ are passionate about. And the descriptions he gives are refugees and the oppressed and prisoners and the poor and the orphans and the widows and We've got to get serious about that. Ephesians 4.32, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. We're people of grace, and we ought to be known for our grace more so than our condemnation. John Maxwell defines kindness as the ability to care for each other in the practical details of life. I love that, and uh, many of you have done that. Quality number three of true love is that true love doesn't envy. All right, so be honest. How many of you have ever had trouble with this one? I mean, I I have trouble with it way too much. So many times I see what others have and I say, I want that. I wish I I could have that and I want it now. I mean, maybe maybe you've dealt with that. Or maybe you've seen uh, somebody else experiencing something that you want to experience. And instead of general, genuine joy for them, you find yourself envious about the vacation they're taking or the place they're going or the children they have or the marriage they have or you name it. We've got to understand that true love rejoices when others rejoice, no matter how difficult that can be. Qualities number four and five of true love is that true love doesn't boast and it's not proud. There's nothing worse than spending time with prideful, arrogant, and boastful people. John Maxwell writes that the person who chooses to ignore that true love doesn't envy, doesn't boast, and isn't proud is displaying envy, boasting, and pride. And he has an equation for that. That says envy plus boasting plus pride equals insecurity. And I like that. People who are envious about what others have then boast about what they have or take too much pride in who they are oftentimes are really struggling with insecurity themselves. And then Maxwell says security is truly the key to relationships. You show me a good relationship, whether it's a marriage or a friendship, and I will show you that, there, that at the very heart of that relationship is security. The two people feel secure enough to share their heart, to be vulnerable, to be honest. They can lay it on the line knowing that the other person has their interest at heart. They can get down to real issues, but not in a revengeful or bitter way. Show me people in a relationship who can't talk about the real issues of life and aren't able to look at each other with honesty and integrity, and I'll show you a relationship that lacks security. You don't have a good relationship if security isn't the foundation of it. You may get together and do things. You may go places together. You may have conversation. But security is always the foundation of a love relationship. And then he uses the example of Juan Carlos Ortiz, who was a circus trapeze performer, who always performed with the net below him. And he talked about what it did for him. Performer said, obviously, it keeps me safe. But he said, let me tell you what the net really does for me. It makes me a better performer. And Ortiz said, what do you mean it makes you a better performer? He said, it's very simple. Because the net is there, I feel secure. And because I feel secure, I'm willing to risk more. I'm willing to try an extra turn, an extra twist. I'm willing to try a trick that I wouldn't try at all. But that security releases me to reach my potential. And I believe that's true in every marriage relationship, relationships that we have with our children, relationships with the people who work below us or above us. It's true where there's security, the other person reaches their potential. Do you have that in your relationships? Okay, qualities number six and seven of true love is that true love isn't rude and it's not self-seeking. There's all sorts of different translations of the Bible and the word that the NIV translates rude is translated in our English Bibles in other ways, different ways. J.B. Phillips translates this as love practices good manners. I like that. The Corinthian church was full of schisms. They, they were people that should have gotten along, but they didn't. They were rude to each other. They'd forgotten common decency. They cared more about their own agenda than the overall life of the body. 
It's amazing how often rudeness is accompanied by being selfish. When we're rude, it's an indicator that we feel that our needs are more important than the needs of someone else. And isn't it amazing that sometimes the people that we're most rude with are the people that we ought to love the most? They're the people that we become comfortable with, our spouse or our children or the people that uh, we see more than anybody else. But you know what? If the heart of rudeness is selfishness, then others may not see your, uh, then others may not see your rudeness. Um, but you won't be able to hide your selfish heart. It's so easy to pick out self-serving people. Clause number eight of true love is that true love isn't easily angered. Some of you might be saying, okay, I'm in trouble here. I mean, I'm doing great in all this other list of what true love is, but I got a short fuse. I I can lose it in a second. My family knows it. The people I work with know it. My children know it. And listen, if that's you, I want to encourage you, get some help. Get some anger management. Do something, all right? Nobody fell in love with their spouse because, you know, the woman went on her first date and she meets this guy and he just starts berating her on that date. She doesn't come home and say, let me tell you about this great date I had. He got mad at me. He yelled at me. He was furious at me. Okay, nobody falls in love with that. And many people, that's their daily reality. They're dealing with somebody yelling at them and treating them like garbage. If that's the case, again, you need to get help. True love doesn't get angry. Maybe you've heard the story of the elderly woman who was preparing to park her expensive Cadillac in a parking lot. And she's getting ready to park, and this 16-year-old kid who just got his license in his brand new car kind of swerves in front of her and steals the park from her, the parking lot space from her. And he turns around and he goes, ha-ha, that's what you get when you're young and fast. And her blood just boiled immediately. And so she decided, I'm going to teach this young punk a lesson. And so she floors her Cadillac and just rams into his car in the parking lot and leaves this huge dent. And the kid is absolutely shocked. And she gets out of her car and she says, oh, to be old and rich. It's great. It's great to be old and rich. (laughs) Love is not easily angered. All right, quality number nine of true love is that it keeps no record of wrongs. In other words, true love learns to forgive and to let go. True love learns to forgive and to let go. Notice I didn't say true love learns to forgive and forget. For some of us, we'll never forget this side of eternity. It's something that God can do, and, uh, and he can give us the ability to do that if he so chooses to do. But for some of us, that forgetting just isn't going to happen. And we can't control the fact that we remember it, but it is possible to forgive and let go. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Several years ago, Al Quie, the former governor of the state of Minnesota, um, had left his office as governor, and many of you don't know this, but he went on to work for Prison Fellowship Ministries, who does the angel tree that we've got out in the hallway there. And he was the vice president, and he would go to these different, of uh, prison fellowship, we'd go to these different prison fellowship dinners around the country. And he says, I'll never forget one uh, night, he says, this woman came up to me at a, at a dinner, a fundraising dinner, and said, the man I ate dinner tonight, the man that I ate dinner with tonight killed my brother. And he writes, the words spoken by a stylish woman at a prison fellowship banquet in Seattle amazed me. She told how John H. had murdered her brother during a robbery, served 18 years at Walla Walla, and then settled into life on a dairy farm where she had met him in 1983, 20 years after his crime. Compelled by Christ's command to forgive, Ruth Youngsman had gone to her enemy and pronounced forgiveness. Then she had taken him to her father's deathbed, prompting reconciliation. He writes, some wouldn't call this a success story. John didn't dedicate his life to Christ. But at that prison fellowship banquet last fall, his voice cracked as he said, Christians are the only people I know that you can kill their son and they'll make you a part of the family. He said, I don't know the man upstairs, but he sure is hounding me. And Quee writes, John's story is unfinished. He hasn't yet accepted Christ, but just as Christ died for us, regardless of our actions or or acceptance, so Ruth forgave him without qualification. Even more so, she became his friend. Incredible story. Last one, quality number 10, is that true love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. True love protects the reputations of others. True love is the dad who makes sure that what enters a home via the television or the internet is wholesome. It's the friend who fights for the reputation of another when lies are being spread about that person. This is the person who isn't participating in malicious gossip or talking poorly about someone behind their back. So how are you doing on that lately? 
Listen to what Jesus said in John 13, 34 and 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I wonder how many of us struggle with that. How many of us have been withholding love from people in our lives? Maybe there's somebody who hurts you and you just say, Pastor Brian, I, I don't want to show love to that person. Maybe it's somebody who years ago did something at Thanksgiving or Christmas and you've never been able to get over it. Maybe it's somebody that did something to you this week and it's just too raw and it's too fresh. And maybe it's not somebody that did anything to you at all. Maybe it's just you've allowed some relationships in your life to just kind of go by the wayside. Maybe it's some relatives, cousins or aunts and uncles who you just haven't called and like you, you, you can't even remember how long. John Maxwell was preaching about the fact that when Jesus tells us to love, he's telling us to do it now. This isn't that wait till tomorrow to show love kind of command. He said when, when he preached this at Christmas time in his congregation, he had a guy come up to him between services. And he says, Pastor Maxwell, thank you for preaching that. He says, last week, I called all of my cousins who I haven't talked to in years just to wish them a Merry Christmas, to say, I miss you. And he said, I had the best conversations with every one of them. And it's absolutely changed my week and my relationships. I'm getting together with some of them. It's just this, this great thing. We wait so long to love. And sometimes we wait till it's too late. I want to encourage you, don't wait too long. It's Jesus Christ who gives us the power to love like this. So embrace that gift today. We're going to go into communion here in just a moment. As we do, let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for the patience and the love that you continually demonstrate to us. Lord, we thank you that the descriptors of what true love is all about in 1 Corinthians 13, what many have considered to be the greatest writing on love ever written, is a description of you. It's a description of the way that you care for us and love us and adore us. So God, help us to be people who, who do that in the lives of others. We're, we're imitators of you in this generation. At least that's what we're seeking to be. So help us to live it well. When people see us, may they see the qualities of true love. In Jesus' name, amen.